Welcome to all and welcome back in a by now nicely heated meeting room. Uh, for the two coming hours, you are invited to follow the proceedings of this conference last panel, which is going to discuss the tribunal's contribution to the clarification of the core crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Judge Fostopoka will chair the panel and moderate the discussion. A leading scholar, a prolific writer, Judge Pokar is a member of the ICTY and the ICTR Appeals Chamber. He has been serving uh, with the ICTY for more than 10 years, including as the ICTY president from November 2005 to November 2008. Judge Pokar will preside over a panel consisting of the following three members. First, Professor Paola Gaeta, who worked uh, closely with uh, the then President Nino Cassese. Uh, he was her mentor in the early years of the ICTY. She is now teaching international criminal law at the Law Faculty of the University of Geneva, Switzerland, as well as at the Graduate Institute for International and Development Studies, also in Geneva. Then, and he's sitting on your right side, Mr. Stephen Matthias, the United Nations ESG for Legal Affairs since September 2010. But he knows the ICTY very well, as he was the legal counselor at the US Embassy in The Hague between 92 and 96, which is at the inception of the tribunal. And finally, Professor Ryan Merson, the president of the Law School of the University of Tallinn in Estonia, Estonia, of which he was vice foreign minister between 91 and 92. He also taught in London at the King's College and at the School of Economics. He also held a number of advisor positions, among others with the UN and President Gorbachev. Before I ask your, your attention for uh, President Pokar and his panelists, a reminder, please switch off your cell phone, as this morning we had a number of very nice musical moments. Thank you very much. I hope mine is off. Huh? Well, good afternoon. It's um, indeed a great honor and a pleasure for me to be moderator of the last panel of this uh, successful legacy conference, so well planned by President Robinson and so ably and efficiently organized by his cabinet and the staff of the tribunal to uh, both the president and all the staff involved goes my deep uh, gratitude. Let me also join my colleagues in paying tribute to Nino Cassese and to his uh, prodigious contribution to the foundation and uh, the first significant developments in international criminal jurisdiction and international criminal law. We have heard yesterday and this morning about the role he has played. And we will hear more at the ceremony that will follow in the afternoon at the Peace Palace. Um, the ceremony organized by the Special Court for Lebanon, the last court of the now numerous family a court which uh, saw uh, Nino again as its first president and where he has already presided over some seminal decisions. Nino uh, was uh, a close friend for me of almost uh, 50 years. And our paths crossed several times, in particular in the human rights field where our respective role in international institutions led us to interact frequently. 
the vacuum he leaves, uh, I'm aware I'm just repeating what others have said, uh, is huge. And uh, the best way to honor him is to continue firmly in our commitment for international justice, following the way he has indicated to us. I uh, feel particularly this duty, uh, not because uh, uh, our friendship, but in particular as I had the privilege to be his uh, successor at the ICTY when he resigned in early 2000. A privilege which I felt at the same time as a great responsibility. It was not easy to uh, take uh, the job of replacing Nino in this tribunal, a really difficult uh, task, which almost induced me to not to accept the position. I have to recognize his encouragement dispelled my hesitations, as I knew that I could always count on him and on his advice should I need it. Um, an encouragement, he repeated to me the first time I contacted the tribunal in January 2000, and it was on the occasion of the rendering of the Cooper sketch judgment, the last uh, judicial act of Nino in this uh, tribunal, a, um, a judgment largely based on the crime of persecutions. Um, ironically, two years later, sitting as an appeal judge on a panel chaired by Judge Wald, I participate in the acquittal of some of the um, accused uh, in that case but that was on the basis of new evidence heard on appeal. For the first time, this tribunal did hear evidence uh, on appeal in a case. But, however, the legal contribution given by <coughs> the Cooperage judgment to the clarification of the crime of persecution remained unaffected on appeal and continues to be the basis, even now, for the definition of a crime which is particularly important in terms of the legacy of this tribunal because uh, has become the crime that characterized most of the cases before the LCTY. Uh, it has been said that, that uh, persecution is for the ICTY what genocide is for the ICTR as the, the crime that uh, appears in almost all the cases before uh, the tribunal. And in particular, in Cooper's case, the trial judgment gave the tribunal position on a very uh, complex issue, uh, which is the identification of the underlying acts that persecution encompasses. Um, the, the, the statute of the tribunal was modeled on the Nuremberg Charter in general. The core crimes are those that are in the Nuremberg Charter in part. We will come back to that. Uh, on persecution, the uh, Nuremberg Charter um, indicated that uh, persecution should be committed in association with another crime. And uh, the problem before the ICTY was to decide whether this was, in light of customary law, the case or not. This position of the association of persecution with another crime under the jurisdiction of the tribunal has been explicitly rejected by the ICTY in the Cooperative uh, case. The, uh, the judgment clarified that the crime thanks to its development in the 50 years uh, after Nuremberg, uh, consists of the intentional, gross, or blatant denial on discriminatory grounds of a fundamental right laid down in international customary or treaty law. 
These are the words of the Cooper's uh, judgment. This means that persecution is not limited to crimes enumerated within the statute of the ICTY, but encompasses other acts in violation of fundamental rights, as uh, including attacks on political, economic, and social rights, as well as acts of harassment, humiliation, and psychological um, abuse. The importance of this expanded definition clearly builds on a connection, on a, a tight connection between human rights and humanitarian law, uh, because any gross violation of human rights could come under the umbrella of persecution if committed in, uh, uh, with the, in the conditions where crimes against humanity are committed or uh, and with the discriminatory intent. And in a way, it shows the way uh, how the ICTY contributed to bridge the gap between the two traditional distinct areas of international law, the law of war and the law of peace, the, uh, what is called now international humanitarian law and international law. As, uh, uh, as such, which will be the future of the ICTY definition, however, is still to be assessed, since the ICC statute make a step, made a step backwards, and uh, as to persecutions um, uh, reads that the ICC, that the um, crime must be committed in connection with other acts of crimes within the jurisdiction of the ICC. Whether this will be the position of the court is still to be assessed in the future. As, as we know, the ICC, under the statute, at least to a certain extent, may refer, may uh, recur to um, customary law, where appropriate. I will not uh, expand on what where appropriate means because anybody that has some familiarity with any UN uh, document knows that, uh, I'm trying to steal, that uh, that expression may have a variety of uh, uh, meanings depending on who is reading a, uh, reading a document. Um, now, by referring to persecutions, I wanted that not just to pay tribute to Nino, but also to introduce, by that way, the um, theme of our panel, which is the contribution of the tribunal case law to the clarification of the core crimes of genocide, crimes against human, and war, and the war crimes. Uh, the starting point of our consideration is that uh, after Nuremberg no international judicial assessment has been made of the law for decades. While some international legislation has been adopted by means of treaties which recognize the criminal nature of certain conducts, the Geneva Conventions, the Convention on Genocide and so on, I will not uh, list all these uh, uh, documents, these treaties, though these treaties not necessarily provide for all the elements of the crimes concerned, in particular as to the mens rea requirements. Uh, and we heard yesterday during the first panel how the uh, assessment of customary law has uh, worked in that respect to complete also the, uh, the, uh, the treaties. Um, one of the Tadic uh, outcomes and, uh, is uh, Tadic was put the accent on customary law on one hand, but on the other hand has interpreted the famous paragraph 34 of the Secretary General report in the sense that treaties can be the basis for decisions of the ICTY. The problem is that treaties normally do not contain a complete criminal norm. 
in all its elements. So even applying treaties, one has to uh, make recourse to uh, customary law in order to complete at least the provision of, uh, uh, of the treaty. Um, I was a bit uh, <clears throat> in difficulty when preparing the, um, um, say, the, the schedule for this, uh, for this panel because uh, we do not have the time to uh, discuss all the crimes. And uh, the title, say, the clarification of the core crimes, which is all the crimes, essentially, crime against humanity, genocide, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, war and war crimes. And uh, clearly, we cannot do it in the panel. One possibility would have been to not to deal with what has been dealt yesterday in particular. But that too is not entirely satisfactory, so I chose to uh, limit ourselves uh, without prejudice to any question that may be uh, uh, brought by the panelists and uh, any specific issues that may come during the discussion, but to limit ourselves to a sort of overall assessment of the clarification brought about by the case law of uh, um, the tribunal. Um, there are some issues that uh, need to be mentioned in this regard, where the legacy of the ICTY, besides clarifying the element of each individual crime, might bear a role in the evolution of international criminal law. And I would mention first that the connection between different categories of core crimes. In particular, the connection between war crimes and crimes against humanity. It is well known that uh, the war crimes and crimes against humanity were at the beginning interconnected. The London Charter made it clear that uh, uh, the, a number of crimes were to be Consider in connection, the crime is mentioned to be considered when in connection with any other crimes with the jurisdiction of the uh, tribunal, which means crimes against peace and uh, war crimes. So, uh, crimes against humanity did not have an independent status, they were existed uh, only as far as they were connected with uh, the two other categories of crimes, aggression and, um, and uh, war crimes, which uh, may uh, have been due to the fact that uh, the notion of crime against humanity was not at the time very clear. We are before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have to bear in mind the human rights movement did not exist in international law yet, or was not affirmed in international law, and that uh, what states did within their countries in uh, uh, dealing with the individuals in their countries was something that remained within the domain, the internal, uh, the internal domain. Linking these crimes to war or to aggression gave them a sort of international dimension that uh, and uh, the, the, uh, those, the drafters of the London uh, Charter couldn't uh, go very much beyond that. But we know also that after 45, this link has been progressively uh, dropped. It is a link that is not... Uh, uh, however, the statute of the tribunal, again, maintains that link to a certain extent because as to crime against humanity gives jurisdiction to the tribunal only when the crime is uh, connected, somewhat connected with the war. So uh, the, the connection established in Nuremberg was kept in the tribunal. It was a choice uh, for the tribunal to keep it or not. And, um, 
you think of them to uh, see that the Tardis decision, we have always to refer to that decision because there are so many things, and um, took, made the choice, made it clearly the choice of uh, uh, distinguishing, of separating crimes against humanity from war crimes, completely. It's uh, also interesting to note uh, that the, the Tardis decision considered this as obvious. Does not uh, waste too much uh, lines to explain why this should be. Give some example in the legislation uh, okay, that was passed, uh, international legislation between 45 and, and, the, and the 90s, uh, the, the, the Convention on Genocide, the, some, um, some definition in the Control, starting with the Control Council uh, Law Number 10 of 45, but going into other uh, decisions, the Convention on the Punishment of Crime and Apartheid, and so on, and then uh, simply declares it is well settled in customary law that crimes against humanity do not require a connection with an armed conflict. Although that uh, uh, statement is made in connection with the conflict, with internal conflict, when dealing with internal conflict, it's uh, interesting to, to say that this decision considers the crimes against humanity are clearly separated from, distinct from uh, war crimes without uh, waiting too much uh, time, wasting too much time to uh, discuss, to discuss the issue, which may be questionable, because perhaps a more detailed, uh, a more detailed uh, discussion might have been uh, important. Although it's obvious that this is the solution once one has decided that the requirement of the connection with the conflict is just a jurisdictional one. And that was the decision made in the uh, Tadic decision uh, itself. It's curious that, uh, uh, and I will not speculate why the Security Council kept that, uh, that connection that, uh, according to the Tadic decision, had already been abandoned in customary law. Uh, it may be simply due to prudence of the Security Council uh, having to act for the first time establishing the court under Chapter 7. And of course, if you link your action with the conflict, you are clearly within Chapter 7. If you don't do that, it may be questionable whether the Security Council has authority to establish a court which is not linked with Chapter 7. Of course, one can, starting from the human rights uh, perspective, saying that gross violation of human rights are per se a threat to peace, so we come under Chapter 7. But perhaps uh, the Security Council wanted to be prudent. This is a question I don't know whether we can resolve ourselves here, but we can, should ask the drafters what was the real reason for that. Now, coming back to the list of core crimes. In Nuremberg, we had a, three, a classification of the core crimes in three categories. War crimes, crimes against aggression. Um, because of the link I have mentioned with uh, the war, all the crimes related to some extent, whether to the use in bellum or to the use at bellum. So we're all connected with the loss of war. The ICTY has played no role as far as aggression is concerned, because this was not given as a category of crimes to the crimes against peace to the tribunal. But genocide was added, which uh, was defined as such after Nuremberg, on the basis also of the case law of Nuremberg, of course, and was singled out of crimes against humanity as an independent crime separation that may be disputed and uh, is indeed disputed by eminent scholars 
including scholars that attend this conference. Um, incidentally, I wish to stress the contribution of the ICTI to the clarification of the crime of genocide. I have just said that genocide is the characterized crime of the ICTR case law. However, the contribution of the ICTY cannot be underestimated. Uh, I cannot refer to all the cases because some, for some of them the appeals are pending, and so I don't want to go into those cases as a judge, but to refer only to the case that has been uh, finally uh, adjudicated, the Kirsten case. I wish to stress the significance of the clarification brought in the finding when genocide occurs through destroying, in part, a national, ethnical, racial, religious group. The clarification provided by the tribunal uh, in defining, in particular, the group, not the targeted group, not only in relation to its numerical size, but to the emblematic nature of the group for the entire population in general, and that in relation to the intent uh, to destroy in part, deserves, in my view, the uh, highest attention because it's a major contribution. There was no other case before this, and uh, there has been no other case after this. So it's uh, a unique decision that's uh, uh, attributable to uh, both the trial chamber and the peer chamber in that case, which uh, um, uh, bears some importance for the legacy of uh, the tribunal as to these uh, crimes. Um, I would say at this point, uh, <coughs> having dealt with genocide, that uh, and dealt with the, the singling out of genocide from crimes against humanity, that there is a trend today to single out of the classical, if I can say so, categories of core crimes, the crime of torture. My question is, and I put the question to my panelists, they will not answer my myself, has the case law of the ICTY, which has dealt several times with torture, contributed to this trend towards an independent consideration of torture? So a trend to attributing to torture an independent status as compared with war crimes and crimes against humanity? Or the case law of the tribunal does not go in that direction, although there is some element in literature in particular that goes in that uh, specific direction. In this context of the classification of the, of the crimes, um, it is uh, well known and has been uh, uh, referred to yesterday in various of the, well, I say in all the panels, but already in the welcoming remarks, uh, Alison Cole made all her uh, welcoming remarks on gender crimes. Now, um, uh, welcoming the, uh, what the tribunal had, uh, had done in this area. And indeed, the tribunal has dealt in a significant manner with, uh, uh, with these uh, uh, crimes. Um, in particular, in uh, establishing that gender crimes have their own independence as compared with crimes against humanity or war crimes. Uh, they come within the categories, crimes against humanity and war crimes, but they do not come as uh, crimes uh, subsumed into other crimes, as uh, even the Article 3 of the uh, Geneva Conventions could let uh, imagine or let's think. Now, 
um, the ICTY has certainly contributed to the independence of the crimes uh, of the gender crimes from other crimes within the classifications. Uh, it's enough to refer to a decision that has been uh, uh, frequently referred to yesterday, which is the, the Kunaraj case, in which the problem was uh, to, one of the problems was uh, not only to establish the elements of the crime of torture and rape, but to see whether rape would come under torture or, as it could be also thought, torture would come under rape. Uh, so if we are facing one crime or we are facing two crimes in that uh, connection with the same conduct. And um, the, the decision of, uh, of the Kunaraj case was that indeed we were facing two different crimes with differentiating elements which allowed the trial chamber to convict the accused for both torture and rape. And this marks clearly the uh, view that the crime of rape is distinguished from the other crime. And I think it's a major uh, contribution in this respect because it was not obvious in light of the legislation. Of course, the assessment was made on the basis of customary law, but uh, uh, it was not obvious that uh, we uh, could go in that uh, direction. And of course, it was uh, uh, a decision which remained later as a, a seminal decision on these, uh, on these matters. But here I would like to put to my colleagues here the same question I'm putting on uh, torture. Are we facing a trend or a contribution of the ICTY to an independent consideration of gender crimes as a new category in the classification of the crimes, or a new area, a completely new area, or are we simply uh, clarifying issues within the, category, the existing categories of a crime? If I uh, go back to the intervention made <coughs> yesterday afternoon by Patricia Vidal Sellers, she, I interpreted it as uh, a, a well, as a view, uh, as expressing the view that in fact gender crimes are a, a separate category that should have its independence, its autonomy, and be dealt with uh, uh, separately. I don't know whether this is uh, what my colleagues will share or not, and I wonder whether the contribution of the ICTY in that direction has been, uh, has been uh, uh, important. Let me conclude the, this introduction by one argument uh, that was, uh, I took from some debate yesterday on uh, the reference to domestic jurisdictions. There was something that was uh, dis discussed yesterday afternoon, and which puts the two legacies, uh, the legacy, regional legacy of, uh, we discussed last year, and the global legacy we'll discuss in the year, on, uh, um, put as the clearly interconnected. Because uh, when we define the crimes, one of the legacies, if any, will be that these definitions will be taken up by domestic courts. Uh, it's true, frequently domestic courts will not try crimes as international crimes. Frequently they will try as domestic crimes. Um, and not necessarily when faced with a case, they will insist in dealing with the case as international. But 
the fact that there is uh, uh, the, these are international crime should lead in the long run states jurisdictions to deal with them applying international law and applying the international law using the international case law as a precedent in many in many situations if not as the law assessed but at least as a president taking into account the international uh, international case law and this is in the region and globally uh, by the way there are several cases concerning the regions of the icty ictr that have been dealt with in uh, other jurisdictions so the interplay between international and domestic uh, jurisdiction is uh, global, goes beyond the region, is mainly focused in the region, but may go beyond uh, the region. I think this is an important uh, feature of the legacy of uh, this tribunal. Also to have shown clearly, the ICC is going in the same direction now, but to have shown that uh, there must be an interplay between international and domestic uh, and domestic jurisdiction, not only through the referrals, but also through what has been uh, uh, considered yesterday a sort of assistance by the international courts to domestic courts, because at the end the primary responsibility for trying uh, um, uh, crimes, whether domestic or international, is for the domestic uh, jurisdictions. I will uh, stop here and I will give the floor to my panelists uh, and starting with Paola. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, you have raised uh, so many issues in your introductory part and, and it's difficult to take all of them. Um, of course, the last one you have raised is uh, uh, really crucial, I would say, and there is hope, I think, to see more and more national courts applying international courts decisions. I think some of the examples are uh, given by the U.S. These uh, courts uh, applying the Alien Tort Statute Act. Uh, they often refer to the ICTY case law in dealing in civil cases. But of course I would like to thank the organizer of this conference for inviting me and I will try, I promise the translators that I will try to speak slowly in plain English if possible. Not sure. Um, among the various uh, issues that you have raised, uh, I've uh, decided to deal with the issue of torture and whether or not the ICTY case law uh, has given a contribution to the um, torture as a core crime, uh, different from war crimes and crimes against humanity under customary international law. And uh, in particular, uh, I would like to address the issue of whether or not, unlike <coughs> the torture convention, which makes torture a crime per se, uh, the possible definition of torture as a discrete crime under customary international law would need uh, the state official uh, involvement requirement as the torture convention provides. And the crucial, uh, the landmark decision of the ICTY in this respect is the Kunarats decision, which has been mentioned many times yesterday and today also by the president, uh, by the chairman. So why I've decided to deal with this very picky topic? Uh, well, first, because I've written an article on this and therefore the task has been um, easier. Uh, but I really think that uh, the um, Topic is an important one for three main points. Uh, the first one uh, is that once we deal with the issue of torture and whether or not uh, the state official involvement requirement is requested or not, after all, we discuss whether or not torture as a war crime and crimes against humanity first and above all can be committed by private individuals, simply like that. And therefore, I think it's crucial to make international criminal law as a separate and autonomous branch of public international law, independent, totally independent from any issue of state responsibility. And second, uh, I think that the Kunarat's decision must be commended because 
it tried to depart from the previous case law of the tribunal, the Peace Chamber decision in Ferungia, for example, taken a different stand on the issue. The facts were different, so therefore the trial chamber managed to depart from the Peace Chamber previous decisions. But nonetheless, I think this was a sign of maturity uh, by the tribunal to be capable of revising its own jurisprudence when it was necessary to do so. And third, um, I think that the Kunarat's decision has um, followed an important methodology, in particular when it has stressed forcefully that human rights notions are of course important to, to try to um, interpret international humanitarian law rules uh, when those rules uh, do not contain definition of particular um, uh, institutions, but nonetheless, uh, the uh, trial chamber in Kunaratz uh, um, had a word of caution uh, because it said one must be very cautious because, after all, human rights law uh, is a body of law which is meant for a different purpose in comparison to international humanitarian law. So I think it is a very important uh, decision. What was the final finding of the Kunaratz on this issue? It's very well known, and the a uh, tribunal said that uh, in the case of torture as a war crime and a crimes against humanity, it is not requested that the person has acted qua state official or with involvement of a state official. And in the Kunarats, this, is very, this was very crucial because the accused were not acting as state officials or quasi-state state officials and without the involvement of a state official. They were acting as private individuals. Therefore, it was very crucial for this tribunal to tackle this issue. And uh, in this way, the Kunaras decision has given, the decision is 2001, and in this way, the decision has given, I would say, authoritative support um, to the decision in the elements of crimes of the ICC to indeed drop the state official involvement requirement in the definition of torture as a war crime and crimes against humanity. The issue was debated, of course, for the elements of crimes, and the Kunarats has given the reasoning for it. Let me now deal with the, the main point of my presentation is that I do agree with the final result. I don't agree with the reasoning of the Kunarat's decision, and I'm sure that Mr. Chairman would not agree with me. <laughs> um, and I will try to explain why the tribunal has missed an important opportunity to my mind to clarify um, what a core crime is and for what, what, what could be the reason for identifying among the different forms of criminality the difference between an ordinary crime and international crime, and in particular a core crime, perhaps. So to try to address this issue, I must give a bit of uh, legal framework. And uh, very quickly, of course, I would say that torture as a crime, as a criminal conduct, uh, was not defined in the instruments uh, which uh, made reference to it, in particular Torture was considered to be a crime against humanity under Control Council Law Number 10. It was not included torture in the statutes of the Nuremberg Tribunals and the Tokyo Tribunal. It first appears as a crime in Control Council Law Number 10. And uh, it appears, of course, in the grave breaches provisions of um, the four Geneva Conventions of 1949 as a crime and is prohibited by our common Article 3 of the Conventions, although we know very well that Article 3 per se does not criminalize any conduct. It's customary international law which has provided for the criminalization. Torture has not even been defined in the various uh, pure, purely international human rights instrument which contain a prohibition of torture, uh, in particular the UN Declaration, um, of human rights, uh, the Covenant, uh, and the European Convention for Human Rights at the regional level, just to mention some of these human rights instruments prohibiting torture. The first definition of torture as a crime uh, has been contained, as we, know, as we all know, by the um, uh, Convention of 1984, the UN Convention 
uh, on torture. And the Convention, as I said before, does provide for the involvement of a state official for torture to be considered a crime and um, be criminalized by uh, state parties. However, the case law of human rights bodies has taken a different stand, and when these human rights bodies uh, uh, for example, the Human Rights Committee and the European Court of Human Rights had to clarify the notion of torture and the prohibition of torture under their um, relevant treaties. Uh, they clearly and plainly stated that the prohibition does not require uh, the state uh, official involvement. Therefore, Torture can be uh, committed also at the private level, and the state can be responsible under the relevant human rights treaty for the uh, private uh, act of torture to the extent that it does not prevent, it does not um, investigate uh, and punish the act of torture. So when the issue uh, was uh, had to be dealt with by the ICTY, first in Delalic and then in Ferunja. In Ferunja, the person was accused of uh, torture as a war crime. The tribunal had to try to define what were the elements of the crime of torture as a war crime, and they naturally turned towards the torture convention, which I think was quite an um, <coughs> understandable instinct, uh, because the torture convention is, of course, a human rights treaty, but it's of a particular type of human rights treaty, like the Gen Genocide Convention. This is a treaty which main, intends to protect human rights through the criminal sanction. And therefore, the definition contained in the Torture Convention is torture as a crime, as an act committed by an individual, and um, engaging his uh, individual responsibility, criminal responsibility. However, the Kunarat's decision disagreed for the reason I have explained, because otherwise uh, the accused couldn't have been found responsible for torture because there were not uh, state officials. And in which way the uh, Kunarat's decision disagreed? As I said, I totally agree with the final outcome of the decision, but the reasoning is not entirely convincing to me. Because they say uh, that uh, the torture convention, I try to um, summarize, uh, the, the reasoning is a very complex one, so I do apologize for, having, for, for being perhaps too short on this, but uh, what they said is that uh, the torture convention, being a human rights instrument, uh, can be misleading if uh, the definition have, has to be imported into international humanitarian law. And I agree with the methodology, uh, of course, when we have to import human rights notions at a different level, one has to be very cautious. But then what I found inherently contradictory is that when the tribunal tried to demonstrate uh, that the customer international law definition for war crimes and crimes against humanity didn't need the state official requirements, well, the tribunal then heavily relied upon the case law and the, the general comment by human rights bodies. So it was asserting what it was negating one moment, one moment ago. And this is mainly the reason for which I don't think that the tribunal is very persuasive in the reasoning uh, because it tries to be a bit contradictory, at least. Um, I think that uh, the tribunal could have perhaps taken a different stand in uh, um, explaining why um, the definition of torture as a war crime and a crimes against humanity does not require the state official involvement requirement, unlike the torture convention. I think that the reason must be found in the fact that as we know, uh, international criminal law is a particular body of public international law which immensely interferes in criminal matters which are normally and naturally reserved to states. And my understanding of the uh, 
rationale, if I may say so, of the entire edifice of international criminal law is that, of course, we want to um, impose, I would say, criminal responsibility when there is little prospect of success of obtaining it by relying on national criminal jurisdiction and national criminal law. And therefore, international criminal law in general, since the origin, deals with the form of state criminality brackets. Uh, therefore, we want to have an international element transforming the conduct into a criminal conduct of international concern. Because as Professor Crawford said yesterday, of course murder is a crime everywhere, but this does not mean that murder is an international crime for which international criminal law has something to say. Because usually murder is persecuted by national courts and they normally tend to do so. So when it comes to torture in the definition of the torture convention, I think that of course the state official requirements there plays an important role because it wants to differentiate uh, the individual, perhaps sporadic case of infliction of severe pain and suffering. It was to distinguish between the ordinary crime of someone for private reasons uh, uh, torturing the wife, let's say, which will be an ordinary offence, and the, the international element requested to, to attract the international concern. And this international element is the fact that the person is acting under the colour of law or with involvement of a state official and therefore practising what it is an ancient phenomenon of state torture which has been used since centuries to extract information, to obtain a confession, and so on and so forth, since the Middle Ages. And I think that in the torture convention, the state official requirement has been put also to prosecute, even under universal jurisdiction, under the Aude de Raio de Care rule, a crime of international concern because it has been inflicted by state official. This is the international element which transform the crime or into an international crime. Is it this element necessary when it climbs to the severe infliction of pain and suffering deliberately upon an individual as a war crime and crimes against humanity? Well, my answer would be no. Why? Because the international element is already enshrined in the general definition of the big category of war crimes and crimes against humanity. In crimes against humanity, the private infliction of pain and suffering would in any case, would in any case require the fact that this act is part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. And this is the international element which help us to distinguish between the ordinary act committed by a husband against the wife and the crime of international concern. In the case of war crimes, torture of war crimes, of course, what matters, and the tribunal says it very clearly, is the status of the victim, the fact that you are a person who is protected under the Geneva Convention, so you are not a non combatant in non international, no combatant, I can't say so, uh, um, or you are a civilian in non international conflict. Uh, there, the fact that in connection to the war nexus requirement, you inflict severe pain and suffering upon a person, uh, like a protected person, well, this is the, I would say, the international element. And of course, when it comes. Uh, um, to other war crimes, which has nothing to do with torture, but to violations of methods of warfare, the nexus would be there. Um, so I think that this is a very important thing to, to keep in mind, because this would therefore allow me to say that uh, if torture per se should become or has become a discrete crime under customary international law, and therefore the, 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 it's something that does not require a war crime or crimes against humanity context to be punished uh, by, by international and national courts. Well, I would keep, I would tend to say that yes, of course it has become a, perhaps a discrete crime, but the state official requirement must be there. 
um, because otherwise I would fi fail to see the, the importance of the crime for the international community if it would be a discreet private act of torture. And do I have time? No. Okay, so I stop here because I wanted just to add that, of course, for the human rights perspective, the purely human rights perspective, I totally understand why the requirement of state official involvement is not requested because, of course, the state under human rights treaties, under the current interpretation of human rights treaties, is there to be a guarantor of freedom and rights of individuals and therefore if he does not intervene to prevent or punish act of private torture it has committed a violation of the human rights treaty but the human rights as you said has a different scope and purpose than international criminal law thank you thank you Paula.